Outside, it's about 94 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The wind howls through the snow. No firewood, no blankets, no roaring flames. And yet beneath a layer of ice and earth, an Alaska native family is sleeping warm. Inside what they call the tent of life. Imagine this. It's about 94 degrees below zero Fahrenheit outside. The wind is so fierce that it drowns out your own heartbeat. Even metal turns brittle and snaps like a twig in this cold. Your car battery would die in minutes. Your smartphone would shut down before you could even call for help. But somewhere beneath a small mound of snow and earth, an entire family is sleeping comfortably. No electric heater humming in the background. No thick down comforters piled high. No roaring fireplace crackling with logs. Just a tiny flame, no bigger than your thumbnail, flickering quietly in the darkness. For over a thousand years, Alaska native families survived winters that would kill most people in less than ten minutes. They didn't fight the cold. They studied it until it became their ally. Outside, the storm screams. Inside, air barely moves trapped between walls of sod and snow. Each layer holding a secret. Still air is warmer than moving air. A single stone lamp, a quillic burns whale or seal oil, its flame the size of a thumbnail, but it's warmth enough to keep the room alive. The ceiling sweats with frost. The floor covered with grass and hides breathes like insulation. Children sleep against the inner wall. Elders tend the flame adjusting the wick with a bone pick, never too high, never too low. This isn't a tent of cloth. It's a living organism, half shelter, half machine, built not to conquer the Arctic, but to coexist with it. Outside, 94 degrees below zero Fahrenheit bites. Inside, it stays just above freezing, and that difference means survival. We think survival means fighting nature, but the Alaska native way was to listen and build with it. Their homes weren't planted on the land. They were grown from it, half buried, half breathing, part shelter, part ecosystem. The frozen ground you see isn't the enemy. It's a shield. Once you dig just a meter below, the earth stops changing temperature. Down there, it stays around zero, even when the air outside drops to 94 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So they built into that balance. A hand-dug shelter pit in the frozen ground, walls packed tight with sod grass and raked snow. Each layer trapped tiny pockets of air in visible insulation chambers. Then came the roof, a skeleton of driftwood and whalebone covered in earth, sealed with frozen moss. No gaps, no drafts, only stillness. And in that stillness, warmth accumulates. Their ancestors understood what thermodynamics textbooks call convective stability. Warm air rises, so they built low ceilings. Cold air sinks, so they slept on raised platforms lined with hides. Every curve of the house followed the logic of breath slow circular contained. There was no roaring fire, no smoke-blackened ceiling. Just the steady flame of the kulik, the stone lamp that burned pure oil, oxygen, and faith. Women tended the lamp through endless nights, feeding it with seal fat, trimming the wick with care. It gave light heat and even cooked the food all in silence. And above the roof, sweated frost that froze into a crystalline shell, a natural insulation layer. Snow outside frost... Inside, both worked together like the walls of a thermos. In modern science, we'd call it passive heating. In their language, it was simply life kept in balance. Because in the Arctic, the line between warm and dead is measured not in fire, but in understanding. Step inside. The first thing you feel is silence. Not the silence of emptiness, but of containment. Every sound is softened, every breath stays near. The air smells faintly of oil hides and earth. Your eyes adjust, and the world shrinks to a circle of orange light. In the center sits the kulik, 
a shallow stone lamp flame flickering against the curve of the wall. It burns without smoke, without noise, only the soft hiss of melting fat. Around it, life organizes itself like a heartbeat. To the left, a woman mends a seal-skin parka by lamplight, her hands moving slow, deliberate, never wasting motion. Beside her, strips of dried fish hang from a rack absorbing warmth. The smell mixes with smoke and salt, clean, ancient. Children whisper beneath caribou hides their cheeks flushed from the gentle heat. The floor beneath them isn't cold, its layered driftwood grass moss hides. Each step presses into softness never ice. An elder tends the flame. Every few minutes he leans forward, a carved bone pick in hand to adjust the wick. Too tall, and the lamp will smoke. Too low, and the flame will fade. Warmth here isn't controlled by force. It's maintained by attention. Along the curved wall, the frost glows silver. Each crystal reflects the lamp like stars frozen mid-breath. When someone exhales, their vapor curls upward, meeting frost, turning into water, then ice again. A living rhythm between body and shelter. Above the entrance tunnel, a faint drip marks time, warm air, escaping snow, sealing the edges tighter. The house repairs itself as it breathes. Food simmers quietly in a stone pot seal, meat blubber a handful of roots. Each bite releases slow energy fat, becomes fire from within. No one rushes. In a place where daylight may vanish for months, patience is warmth, and warmth is survival. They aren't hiding from the cold. They're becoming part of it, turning stillness into heat and balance into life. At first glance, the Arctic house looks simple, a low mound of snow and sod. But beneath that curve lies one of the most efficient heating systems ever built by human hands. It begins with the earth itself. The floor is not flat. It's shaped like a shallow bowl dug deep into frozen ground. That basin collects warmer air while cold drafts stay near the entrance tunnel. Every degree counts. The entrance is narrow, low, and angled a tunnel that forces you to crawl. Cold air being heavier sinks and stays trapped there. It becomes a natural cold lock, a buffer that keeps the living space above warm. Once inside, the room opens gently upward, curving like the inside of a lung. Every wall is rounded, no corners, no edges, so air moves, slow heat circulates evenly. The inner wall is lined with layers, driftwood, moss, sod, and snow. Each has a purpose. Wood gives structure, moss drinks condensation, sod traps air, snow seals everything tight, four natural materials combined into a single breathing skin. Above the roof slopes inward toward a small vent hole, not a chimney, a breathing point. It lets out moisture, not warmth. Sometimes when the blizzard outside howls, they seal it with a plug of snow and the air inside still stays safe. The lamp, the kulik, sits at the lowest point of the ceiling's curve. Its heat rises gently, brushing the roof. There, frost melts and refreezes, forming a thin crust, an invisible thermal shell. Science calls it phase change insulation. They called it wisdom. Sleeping platforms are raised along the wall, two or three tiers, made from driftwood and covered in hides. The highest beds are warmest, the lowest are for storage or drying meat. Every inch is designed with purpose. Outside, the storm erases all sound. Inside, heat whispers through layers of breath oil and patience. The structure doesn't defy the Arctic, it mirrors it. Snow, earth, and air, the same elements that freeze you, are used here to protect you. No bricks, no metal, no nails. Yet it endures centuries of wind frost and darkness, a living engine built entirely from the cold itself. In the Arctic warmth isn't just a number, it's a relationship. Modern people measure heat in degrees, but the Alaska natives measured it in balance. To them, warmth was not something you owned, 
It was something you shared. A body against a body. A lamp shared between hands. A silence thick enough to keep the heat from escaping. They never tried to overpower the cold, because the cold was endless. Instead, they shaped their lives to move with it, to borrow its rhythm, not fight its rules. When the storm came, they didn't curse it. They listened. Snow pressing against the walls meant insulation was working. The howling wind meant predators stayed away. Even darkness had purpose. It made the light feel alive. Inside those earthen homes, warmth came from many places. The steady flame, the smell of seal oil, the closeness of family, the patience of small movements. You can't rush warmth here. You cultivate it. Every gesture, tending the lamp, layering the hides, sealing the tunnel, was an act of care. The elders taught heat does not come from fire. It comes from harmony. In their language, the word for home also meant breath. Because both must be protected, both can be lost quietly. Even today, when heaters hum and walls are metal, the wisdom remains. If you move too fast, warmth leaves. If you stay still, listen, breathe warmth, returns. Their survival wasn't about strength. It was about respect. For air, for timing, for silence. Because survival in the Arctic isn't a victory over nature, it's a conversation with it. And in that conversation, the truest warmth is not the fire you build, but the peace you keep. We build houses that glow at night, walls of steel and glass. We burn fuel, push buttons, chase comfort. Yet somehow, we're still cold. Our warmth depends on power lines, batteries, screens, a thousand things that break when the storm comes. We forgot what warmth truly meant. The people of Alaska never had thermostats. They had intuition. They read the air the way light dimmed in the lamp the way breath lingered before it froze. Every change was a message. They didn't wait for machines to tell them comfortable. They listened to their own senses, to the quiet hum of the kulik, to the way frost formed on the ceiling, to the feeling of stillness in the air. Their homes were not controlled environments. They were living ecosystems, breathing with the people inside them. Today, we seal our walls tighter, heat our air higher, and still lose energy through our speed. We fill the silence with noise. We chase instant warmth instead of patient balance. But the old Arctic houses teach another kind of technology one made of rhythm, not resistance. They remind us that the most efficient heater isn't the biggest fire, but the smallest flame that never dies that the ground beneath us stores more warmth than we notice, that air when still becomes armor, that energy isn't just what we generate, it's what we keep. Their wisdom whispers through snow and time. Don't fight nature, cooperate with it. A home that breathes, a fire that listens, a people who understood that warmth is not something you take, it's something you earn by learning to move slow enough to feel it. Maybe we don't need more power. Maybe we need more attention. Because sometimes the secret to surviving the coldest place on Earth is remembering how to be still inside your own warmth. Outside, the blizzard still howls. Snow drifts over the roof, sealing every crack, every sound. From above, it looks like the Earth has swallowed the home completely. Only a thin line of smoke marks the place where warmth still lives. Inside, the lamp flickers a single heartbeat of light. Children breathe in rhythm. Elders rest their hands near the flame palms open, never clutching. For thousands of years, this was enough. A stone lamp, a few hides, the patience to listen, and the knowledge that warmth isn't made by force, but by respect. When the storm passes, they'll dig out the entrance step into a world washed white and silent. No damage. No waste. The house remains breathing quietly beneath the snow proof that intelligence doesn't always roar. Sometimes it whispers. Modern survival often begins with fear. 
ancient survival began with observation. They didn't conquer the cold, they collaborated with it. And that's the lesson they left us. You don't need to fight nature to live in it. You just need to understand its rhythm. So next time the wind bites, when the room feels too still or the night too long, remember the kulik, that small, steady flame, the kind that doesn't burn bright but burns long. Because somewhere under the ice, someone once built warmth out of silence. And maybe we still can. If this story made you see warmth differently, share it. Let others remember that intelligence isn't measured in comfort, but in balance. The Arctic still speaks. We just have to be quiet enough to hear it.